So here's a video I never thought I'd make. Star Wars is dead. Disney killed it. I've been thinking over the last few days trying to distill my thoughts about what it was that made Star Wars resonate with so many of us, millions of us, tens of millions of us around the world for decades. What is it exactly that George Lucas got so right and Disney got so wrong? Disney seems to basically blame the fans time and time and time again when their stories don't resonate like Lucas's did. What they seem to be missing is that most of us grew up as Disney fans and also as Star Wars fans. So when we heard that Disney bought Star Wars and that we were going to get more Star Wars movies with our heroes, I think most of us were actually excited. We were rooting for Disney. And we continue to root for Disney even though the water seemed to get a little shaky for a while. The conclusion I've come to is that in a tragic twist of irony, Disney never understood Star Wars. And what they did understand of it, so many of their writers actively hated. Today, I am proud to announce the Walt Disney Company is acquiring Lucasfilm, the global entertainment company founded by George Lucas and the home of the legendary Star Wars franchise. Fans can expect a new feature film, Star Wars Episode Seven, in theaters worldwide in 2015. We're thrilled that George has entrusted the future of his extraordinary legacy to the Walt Disney Company and recognize what an honor it is. We truly understand the responsibility that comes with being the caretakers of such iconic characters that are beloved by hundreds of millions all over the world. George Lucas, as you probably know, was a student of a man named Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell thought that all the world's great stories and myths could be sort of fit into the same basic story map. That all the world's great religions and cultures were basically trying to say the same thing. Now, personally, I think, and the more I've studied, the more I think Joseph Campbell tried to force everything a little bit too hard to fit because there are clearly differences between the world's great religions in my view. But Lucas and Campbell were onto something profound. Borrowing from the insights of psychologist Carl Hume, they seem to think that human beings are born with something kind of like an instinct. That is, we're not blank slates when we're born, but we're born with the ability to learn and the ability to know that we need to breathe and do basic things instinctively. But we're also born, according to Jung, with a sort of collective unconscious or instincts for story. We have longings for psychological fulfillment in story. Lucas knew and actually had a deeper concern with Star Wars. Why do you think the Star Wars saga has marked the audience and crossed generations until today? You know, when, when I did it, everybody said, oh, spaceships, let's just put spaceships in a movie. And I said, that's not what it is at all. I used to always think of mythology as a form of psychological archaeology. I had studied Joe Campbell, I continued to study Joe Campbell, and I really tried to take these psychological motifs from mythology all over the world. As a result, I was able to take ideas that go through all societies, through all the ages, and bring them down and put them into a razzle-dazzle Saturday matinee serial action-adventure film. And did you consciously think about when you were making it that you really wanted to make this a force for the good? Yes. Part of it is to bring back some of those old psychological motifs from mythology, just the basics of what are friends for? Why do you join together in a society to help each other? Your relationship to your father, your relationship to the generation that came before you that mm -hmm. seems to have screwed everything up. And how do you feel about passing that on to your kids? And how do your kids feel about the fact that you've been handed this mess from the earlier generation? You know, can you be stronger than your father in terms of the temptations? Now, I'm not making this video trying to contribute to the vitriol and anger that is the Internet. Um, I typically try to be restrained. But it does boggle the mind how Disney pays over a billion dollars for a franchise not understanding what it was. It seems as though Disney thought if they just kept the lightsabers and the cool spaceships and the aliens that the fans would just keep eating it up because that's basically what Star Wars is, right? If we build a generic, ugly, concrete hotel and charge astronomical prices and put some generic space things in it, well, people will pay for it, right? Because it's Star Wars. But they fundamentally misunderstood what Star Wars was to begin with. For George Lucas, who was a student of Joseph Campbell, uh, he was concerned about society because Lucas understood, having studied anthropology, that societies need something to hold them together. And in modern life, so much of what has held modern societies together has been stripped away. Traditional religion, community, 
common cause and stories have been stripped away. For what Lucas and Campbell realized following Carl Hume was that human beings need stories and that stories do feed and nourish something deep psychologically. George Lucas, knowing these things had been lost in modern society, really seemed to try to make more than just a space movie that had been done before, and he liked those, but he used the space movie, the, the sci-fi genre, as a vehicle to tell his story. And that was, he was trying to revisit deliberately the monomyth of Joseph Campbell. He was trying to give us a story in common in the modern world. Now, he specifically said he doesn't wish for this to replace religion because he thought religion had a value in modern society. Um, faith is uh, the, the glue that holds us together as a society. Faith in our, in our, our culture, our, our world, or you know, whatever it is that we're trying to hang on to uh, is a very important part of, uh, I think, uh, allowing us to, to remain stable, remain balanced. I put the force into the movies in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Uh, more a belief in God than a belief in any particular, uh, you know, religious system. You know, I, I think you should have an opinion about that. Do you have an opinion or are you looking? Well, I think there is a God. No question what that God is or what we know about that God, I'm not sure. The central epic of our culture has, has been the Bible, and it's about you know, fall, wandering, redemption, return. But the Bible no longer occupies that central place in our culture today. More and more people today, are, young people in particular, are turning to movies for their inspiration, not to organize religion. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I hope that doesn't end up being the, the course that this whole thing takes because um, I think there's definitely a place for organized religion. That's a very important part of the social fabric. Uh, and I would hate to find ourselves in a completely secular world uh, where you know em entertainment was passing for some kind of religious experience. But ask yourself this question, what is it that actually holds modern society together? I would say actually not a lot anymore. In the past, deeper things have held us together. Common cause and our stories, whether it's around a campfire or in church, societies give common identity to a people. This is what Lucas was trying to revisit for the modern audience. And so because of these things, I would argue that Lucas's Star Wars, though there are certainly issues, they're not perfect, they're not high art, they do rival something like Richard Wagner's attempt at creating a modern, modern myth for the German people. Well, so the book is 29 essays on works of art as various as the Charioteer at Delphi and uh, George Lucas's Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you choose? Well, um, I, I, my original plan was never to include George Lucas. It, it happened that I was looking for strong contemporary art to end the book with, and I couldn't find any samples of it. All, all I saw was, I saw good work that reminded me of 10 other prior examples of art from the last 200 years, which, which, which convinced me of just how, what a wasteland the current art scene is. I, I'm, I'm talking internationally. So I, I was watching um, TV and the, and the Star Wars films again and again and again being shown on a, on a cable TV channel, uh, and I became obsessed with this great finale of Revenge of the Sith from 2005, film that George Lucas um, directed, and it's, it's the last thing, last film made in the Star Wars series, but it narratively belongs, it belongs in the middle. And I thought, my goodness, this is one. This is so powerful. This is like grand opera. It's it's like it's like landscape painting from romanticism. It's like apocalyptic destruction of, of you know of industrial culture and politics. Every, everything going with this uh, unbelievable dance theater of, of the longest duel ever filmed in movies. And it's passionate engagement. You know, on a lava river <laughs> between these two men. Right? And I, and, and so I, I became overwhelmed. And so I'm saying, okay, and I will I will defend this uh, you know, to the to the death is that um, the, the, this long finale of Revenge of the Sith is the most powerful and the most significant work of art in any genre, including literature, in the last 30 years. And this is why, years after we were 12, even though I, one of the best memories of my childhood was going to see the re-release of the original trilogy in theaters uh, with my dad. I'm glad I have that memory. It's one of the best I have. But eventually we grew up. And yet Star Wars, for many of us, millions of us, stayed extremely relevant and something we just kept coming back to and back to. So here's what I think Disney got dead wrong. Storytelling is essentially an unspoken social contract between author and reader, between filmmaker and audience. 
If you stick with us through this film or book, we're going, to, we're going to establish expectations. And by the end of this book or film, you will be satisfied because you'll get everything you expected. Maybe in an original or surprising way, but you will leave satisfied. Now, if you take those expectations and the filmmaker or the author drops the plots or twists and subverts the expectations in such a way that the audience feels cheated, well, the audience is going to be extremely dissatisfied. This is exactly half, bluntly, time and time and time again. From the very first Disney Star Wars movie, Episode 7, Disney immediately began to break their end of that social contract. We were promised that we would have Luke, Han, and Leia, Chewie, and maybe Lando all on the screen one more time on one last sunset adventure. Now, of course, we knew there were always going to be new heroes that they could pass the torch to. goes without saying. But we were told we'd get that original cast, the cast we looked up to, our heroes, together one last time. We never did. Not a single scene where our heroes were on screen together on one final adventure. Well, you say, but we got new characters. We got Finn and Rey and Poe. Well, we certainly did get new characters, but they had no story. And that was the problem. Disney's writers, it seems to me, are so focused on a different ideology, obsessed with a different ideology than that which informed George Lucas. A common aspect of modern storytelling, tragically, is to subvert expectations and to overturn tropes, to deconstruct a story and give you something unexpected. Now, I can sympathize with that to a degree because think about the common tropes, the story beats you see over and over in books and movies. The naive, ignorant, hopeful farm boy who longs for a great adventure. An old man comes to him and he is surprised and he turns down the call to adventure but then some cataclysmic event happens in his life and he has to go on this adventure. Sure, no, I understand where you wouldn't want to hit those exact plot points in exactly the same way, time and time again. It can become stale. The problem came when writers in so much of writing today are so obsessed with overturning tropes, they go deeper than the tropes and they dig beneath the surface and dig into that psychological motif that George Lucas worked so hard to weave into his world. What we're left with is not a modern myth, but content. It's a subtle difference between art and kitsch. Glittering images that George Lucas was perhaps, or maybe definitely the greatest artist of our time. Mm -hmm. I do not disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But now that you've written that, The Force Awakens have come, has come out, <laughs> which he, is not George Lucas. No, it's that's Disney, not George. It's who, not, is, who is not it, the greatest artist of our time. It has nothing to do with George Lucas. Uh, and and I, I you, haven't seen it. Think? I wouldn't dream of, I mean, when it's on TV, I'll look at it, please. <laughs> okay, I'm, oh, I don't, do you think I want to sit in the theater and be tortured, okay, by the contamination of my ideals? I'm not going to do that. Case in point, Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker is the Harry Potter for kids growing through the 70s through the probably early 2000s. He's the guy we looked, uh, looked up to as a symbol of hope. What does Disney do? Well, they promise you're going to get to see your hero again. What has he been up to in these last 30 or 40 years? How, in the, how has he made the Jedi return? Because we were promised that he would make the Jedi return in, you know, Return of the Jedi. Well, it turns out Luke Skywalker did not make the Jedi return. In fact, he's rejected everything he ever stood for, has become some sort of a cosmic space atheist, despises institutional force religion, and though you remember him as this hopeful character who risked life and limb for his friends and to redeem his father who was the devil himself because everyone can be redeemed, now tries to murder his nephew in his sleep because he had a bad dream. Disney broke their end of that social contract. And when the fans reacted negatively, in mass, Disney blamed the fans. The same goes for Han and Leia. Nowadays, deconstructing the trope has become the trope. I now fully expect when I watch a movie, especially by Disney, that they are going to try to break my expectations in a very boring, lame, silly way. You thought he was the hero? Oh no, he's really the bad guy. You thought he was powerful? Oh no, he's really... Why do they do this? Well, tragically, it's because it seems apparent to me at this point that contemporary Disney writers see the world through, frankly, a postmodern, almost pseudo-Nietzschean, almost Marxist worldview. They tend to see the world through power struggles. They tend to think of all social phenomena as a struggle of power and in binary relationships between the oppressor and the oppressed. If you have more power than me, it must be because you took it unfairly. Hence, um, institutions are suspect. Institutions that you thought were good, if they're powerful, probably took that power unfairly from someone else who warranted it. 
you thought the Skywalkers were pretty cool. They're suspect too. In fact, anyone can have the power the Skywalkers had, because who gives them the right? Star Wars was sort of a medieval hierarchy fantasy world of chivalry and valor and test of virtue placed into outer space. It wasn't about the physics of the world or even really the spaceships. It was about the epicness of, it was about the epicness of story and the belief that in the end, no matter how bad things get, good will win. This holds true even, I think, for the film score. George Lucas was a storytelling genius, but he also hired a musical genius, John Williams. Decades after the original score, people still buy tickets to go see live orchestras perform John Williams' Star Wars scores. Because it's more than content, it's art. Richard Wagner invented the idea of a light motif. This is a musical theme that you associate with a certain character. So when this theme plays, you know that that character is coming on screen. But this musical theme tells you so much more about that character, non-verbally, that you probably couldn't even express rationally. Richard Wagner invented this for characters like Siegfried or Boonhilde, but John Williams perfected it. To this day, I can't hear Princess Leia's theme without thinking of some ideal form of the feminine. I can't hear the binary sunset theme without evoking some call to adventure. John Williams had clearly drawn from the deep well of the Western musical tradition, like Gustav Holtz, The Planets. Contrast that with Disney Star Wars music, and some of it's okay, but what John Williams didn't write, the majority of it, is not art, it's content. It's noise to fill the space to try to get you to feel a certain way. And that's it. And in story, and in music, I think that Disney Star Wars, tragically, is just another streaming show on another streaming app. Take it or leave it. Well, you could say George Lucas had some minor inconsistencies between the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy. I would say, yeah, he did. There were minor inconsistencies, but overall, it was a great story. It was a tragedy mirrored with a comedy. You see this ironic downfall of the hero, but then his redemption through his son. You have the happiest possible ending at the Return of the Jedi. Now, a fan of the Disney Star Wars can say, but Lucas's dialogue was clunky, and I would say sometimes it was, but even then, it still served a communicative function I Don't Like Sand is a bad line of dialogue, however, it's blunt and it's clunky, but it still serves the narrative. It says something real about Anakin Skywalker as a character. He associates sand with slavery and a desert planet and the sad memories of his mother. It still fits within the narrative. However, Disney Star Wars, though the lines are more polished or natural, don't serve the story whatsoever. So often they go nowhere. Ray, I have to tell you something, sounds more natural, but it doesn't serve a communicative function towards the story in any way, shape, or form. So I watched The Acolyte, and for me, this is the last Disney Star Wars show that I'll watch. I kind of liked Ahsoka, I liked the ending of Clone Wars, but typically, I like the original six that Lucas made. Disney, once again, broke the promises they made in the storytelling social contract, and yet again, they're blaming the fans and not possibly themselves. This shows me yet again, I can't trust them with this modern myth because they don't understand it. If anything, some of the writers are trying to use that for their ideological messaging. It kind of reminds me of those 90s Christian movies, the ones that were actually kind of bad movies with cringy stories, but they got the message across. Well, to me, it didn't forgive the bad art. This is exactly the same thing, just from the ideological left and with a higher budget. George Lucas intended his saga to be something that was uniting to modern audiences. The problem is, Disney Star Wars is divisive. When I watch Disney Star Wars, so often I literally feel like I'm reading, scrolling through social media, reading a Twitter feed or a Reddit argument or a Facebook squabble about politics. Rather than call us out of ourselves to adventure or to heroism or to wonder or to remember the mystery and the magic of the world, it brings me right back down to earth and shoves my face in modern politics. So when I watch it, I'm just not happy. But a reminder that I think what George tried to teach us when we were kids is true. I think at the end of everything, goodness wins in the end, that heroes are worth having and emulating. It's worth trying to be a symbol of hope for others because no matter how bad things get here, no matter how, many fr no, no matter how fragmented or divided, there's always hope. So these have been the rambling thoughts of a former 12 year old boy who is a little frustrated, but no matter what happens, we'll always have George Lucas of Star Wars. And for that, George, you made a story that made so many people's lives better, mine included. 
No matter how bad things got, I could watch Star Wars and escape to a place far, far away. So for that, thank you.